What are you telling me? My name is Marius Hugh and I'm a third year graduate medical student at Southampton, the best university in the graduate medical school world. In this video, we're going to run through five interview questions commonly asked at St. George's graduate medical school interviews. The first scenario is this. Pack a suitcase for a trip where the case can only contain half of the items available. They want to see that you can think logically about what you will need for this trip and basically have a rational system to allow you to select items that you think you're going to need for this trip. I guess what I'd personally do is start with the basics for survival and then pack in order of importance to you until that half of the bag is full. I guess once you've got the basics for survival covered, then you can pack just the fewest number of items that give you the maximum utility or happiness. For me, I'd probably just get the budgie smugglers in, you know, like that, and just like a spork or something, you know, a spork knife. Now, to be honest, I don't really think it matters what you say, so long as you have a logical system that you can communicate effectively, um, you're going to show that you're a good communicator and that you can plan and systematize things accordingly. The next classic George's interview scenario is you're traveling on the London Underground. One of your friends has become separated from the group. Once again, they're testing your ability to logically deduce a plan of action, but they're also testing your ability to communicate that plan to them. A logical approach to this would be going from the least severe option to the most severe. Obviously, you're gonna to wanna to stay calm. You wanna check whether any of your colleagues have actually seen this person go missing. Maybe they're still with you and you're just bugging out or whatever. Once you've established that no one in the group has seen this person and they're not with anyone in the group, you want to check that you didn't have a prior plan to rendezvous, you know what I'm saying, rendezvous. Somewhere in London, for example, at a particular tube stop, in the event that one of your party goes missing. See, this is kind of unrealistic. You're not gonna to go to your group of mates. Oh, guys, um, if one of you goes missing, we'll uh, rendezvous um, at Blackfriars. Now, that's probably not gonna happen, but it's probably worth mentioning anyway. Next thing you might wanna do is try and make contact with this person. Obviously there's Wi-Fi at London Underground stations nowadays. Anyway, you're probably gonna to wanna to text them or bell them and see what they're saying. Have they got lost or where, where the hell are they? If you make contact, that's calm, but failing all of that, you probably just go to the place you were headed for anyway. That's probably the next most likely place that the person you will have lost will just go to. They'll probably go to, yeah, whatever, Buckingham Palace or wherever you're trying to get to in the first place. The next scenario is you have a list of 15 individuals giving their sex, age and occupation. You can save five of them from a nuclear attack. Which five and why? Okay, so what this question is hinting at is, do you think that some lives are more valuable than others? How do you objectively determine the value of a life so that you can compare it to someone else and decide which one is more valuable? Or is the value of every single person's life just the same? no matter what. You know, since you get their age, should you rank them by age and, you know, pick the five youngest people to be saved from this nuclear attack since they would potentially have the most cumulative years to live out of everyone. It might be worth mentioning this thing called qualies here. This stands for quality adjusted life years and it's kind of an assessment of disease burden. It assesses the quality and the quantity of life that might be remaining. The fact that this quality thing exists suggests that not all life years are equal. Life years are context dependent and you can't directly compare someone one's life years without adjusting it for perceived happiness, you know, burden of disease, etc, etc. For this reason, purely looking at the numbers and ranking people by age to choose who should survive this nuclear attack would not be a good strategy. Because for example, you might get a young person who is severely ill and they only have a couple of years left to live. I guess one way to work this out would be to figure out how many high quality life years each member of this 15 person party uh, has left. Rank them in order and have the top five people with the most uh, you know, high quality life years left um, they can survive. The fact that you get each person's occupation suggests that they want you to comment on whether you think that certain occupations are more valuable than others, or rather certain occupations give your life more value than other people's lives. I guess knowing each person's occupation kind of gives you an idea of people's skills, and perhaps like if the goal is to survive after this nuclear attack with only five of you, you're gonna want the people with you know the most relevant skill set so that you can survive for as long as possible. You're probably gonna want someone to look after the health of the group, you know, someone to cook, someone to you know, build shelter, etc, etc. To be honest though, maybe you just want the five people that work the best in a team, save their lives, they're going to be the most likely people to survive because they can communicate the best, um, you know, they can work as a team the best. In the end, maybe the only fair way to pick this is to just draw names out of a hat and pick at random. Alright, so the last two scenarios are quite similar to each other, they're both about breaking bad news. So here we go, as a captain of a football team, inform a member of your team that they have not been selected to play in the final. The next one is inform your neighbour that you have just accidentally 
run over and killed their cat. I heard another one of these scenarios which was to inform someone that the reason they had been breaking out in hives was because they were allergic to their new gerbil. So these scenarios are never going to be easy. Breaking bad news is just a very difficult thing to do and takes years of practice. But at medical school, they give you an acronym called SPIKES that you can fall back on if you're delivering bad news to someone. So I'm gonna run you through that acronym and maybe you can practice doing these scenarios, I don't know, with your friend or with your mum or cat or whoever. So SPIKES, so the S refers to setting. So in delivering the bad news to this person, you're going to want to be in a setting that is appropriate. Essentially in the hospital, this refers to times when bad news is being broken, like literally on the wards, you know, with no privacy. Ideally, you're gonna to wanna to get them in a little side room, somewhere that you can have a private conversation somewhere that you can spend a lot of time with this person and you know console them if they're really upset. P stands for perception. Essentially you want to ascertain what they know so far. In the medical realm I've always seen this in relation to we had that scan done last week. What What is your perception of why we were doing that scan? This is kind of helpful because they can kind of segue you into telling them the information. They can say you know I think we were doing that scan because you know I found that lump and we were checking for you know cancer or whatever. You know, you know what level they're at so you know at what level to enter the discussion. You don't wanna just blindside them with this ridiculously intense news if they have absolutely no idea that it's coming. You wanna fire a few warning shots and just build the conversation slowly up to the point where you're giving them the bad news. I, so I stands for invitation and this is basically where you ask them like, so do you want to hear you know, the bad news today or not. I think this thing is a little bit contrived to be honest and you know, apparently it's just something that you do in, you know, your OSCEs you know, and they always say yes, they wanna hear the bad news. It might be appropriate to ask them, would you like someone to be here with you? Actually, to be honest, it might be worth establishing that at the start when you're setting up. All right, so the next thing is K for knowledge and this is where you just deliver them the bad news. Essentially, you wanna be direct, use plain language, um, take lots of pauses to allow them to digest or give them the information in those bite-sized chunks. That is just gonna limit you kind of overloading them with information um, so that they have no idea what's going on. They'll be shocked anyway, so you wanna try and avoid overloading them too much. E is for empathy. I guess the best way to do this is to bring a pack of tissues with you and just offer them a tissue if they're crying or you know, consider using touch, pat on the shoulder, uh, something not inappropriate, but that shows that you are caring and that you appreciate the struggle that they're going through. Lastly, we've got S again, and that is the summary. And here you wanna sum up what you've said and what the patient has said. You also probably want to work out the next time that you're going to check in with this person. This is because many times the patient is just gonna be in shock. They're not gonna really have understood anything that you've said to them. So they're gonna need a few you know, weeks or days to process this information um, and get back to you with probably more questions. Questions. All right, so that is the SPIKES acronym. Those are the five St. George's scenarios that we were planning on running through today. I hope that was reasonably useful and good luck for your interviews if they're coming up this year. Cheers.